Hi, my name is Sandy, and this is An Accessory Rose webcast where the stories of Appalachia are. Today, I am very happy to welcome in the Kentucky Genealogical Society. I'm happy to welcome them in because this has been a month of Kentucky, but for, for us in genealogy that are working on a platform called WikiTree, but I'm also happy because this is the first genealogical society that we have on Ancestry Roads that is in Appalachia. So let me go ahead <laughs> and introduce to you Kathy and Trisha, both from the Kentucky Genealogical Society. And I should say to make this easy on all three of us, from this point on in the webcast, we're going to call it the society. <laughs> so hi, Kathy. Hi, Trisha. How are you guys? Hi, everyone. Great to see you. And Thanks for I having us. I want to also say happy anniversary. This is your 50th anniversary this year as That's well. Right. So let me introduce you guys a little bit more formally. And Kathy is vice president of membership. And I, I might add for everybody watching that even talking to Kathy a little bit before the live cast started, she was born in West Virginia. Imagine that. So Kathy is a native of Southern West Virginia and re resides now in central Kentucky with her husband, been researching family history for 40 years and belongs to a number of family genealogical and historical societies in Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. That's an excellent mix of central and north central Appalachia. So I, I applaud you for that. Um, Kathy's also written articles and developed presentations on her family and Kentucky history, and currently co leads a genealogy interest group for the golf and is it golf golf or is it golf golf? It is Goff Goff. Goff Goff Family Association. And congratulations. You're now retired after working 45 years in corporate America and resides in Kentucky, serves the Kentucky Genealogical Society as the vice president of membership and is also on the board of directors. So it's, it's awesome to have you in here to talk about the society, but as well as your experience in this area and North Central and Central Appalachia. And then we have Trisha Underwood. Did I say it right? That's right. <laughs> okay. There we go. And Trisha is a retired data scientist professional living in Florida. I hope it's sunny down there today with your husband and two bratty Siamese cats. I can attest, I know what the Siamese are like. <laughs> um, she's a Kentucky native whose family arrived there in the early 1800s. So we're talking, you're one of the first pioneers probably coming in. Your family line is is right there. And in your free time, she's the editor of the Kentucky Family Stories blog. Hold that thought, too, because she's also editor of a book that we're going to discuss in just a few moments. So <laughs> welcome again. I want to let everybody know that if you have any questions about anything that we talk about, if you have any questions about something going on in your own family, your family tree, your ancestors, if you're researching anything like that, then feel free, share your Kentucky story, ancestor story in the chat. We will make sure to answer questions at the end of this webcast. So probably in about 45 minutes, but if you have any questions at all, don't wait, feel free to drop them and we'll make sure that we take care of them towards the end of this broadcast. So let's go ahead and, and dig in, ladies, because we've got a lot to cover. And I think what we should start maybe first is this beautiful website. So this is fresh. This is what, five days old? Is it even five days old? Uh, we just launched last uh, last Friday. Look at these pictures. They're gorgeous. It, it's, it's The pictures brought me in. But this website is so packed with information. And what we're going to do is we discuss what the society is, what you do. We're also going to bring up an interchange website as well and show you some of the pictures that his site is jam packed with as long as, excuse me, as well as a library of how many webinars would you say is in there, Tricia? There's a hundred and I'm going to add about 10 more today. Okay. And, and they are very unique titles. They are ones that you probably have been researching or hoping to research, but they're also ones that you might not have 
ever known about that you're just curious about. So if you're a history lover, this is for you as well. You don't have to just be a genealogist or into a family tree or researching to be a member of the Kentucky Genealogical Society because their webinars are packed with history. There's tips as well, but packed with history. And I think I should probably mention that to become a member, to be able to watch those, mem those webinars is only $20 a year. I can tell you that that's worth the price of admission. We were talking about it earlier. That's cheaper than a movie at this point going out in over a hundred and you're going to add 10 more webinars. So you guys will be busy probably the whole year if you become a member today. Okay, let's keep going. Let's talk a little bit about your history. And when I'm going to bring up your history page here. And which one of you ladies would like to talk about when this started? We know it's 50 years ago. Was there a need 50 years ago? Why did we start this? Uh-oh, we lost Trisha. Uh-oh. Kathy, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> well, Trisha knows a lot more about this than I do. Uh, but uh, the society was started in Central Kentucky and they had a small uh, group of people. This is a great photograph to show you the it's group that, that they you. had. And, um, you know, they have worked very hard over the years to, to uh, keep the, the uh, society going. And we just keep growing and, and we hope we continue to grow. Um, it was mostly uh, people that were involved were living in Kentucky. They had a, a few outside of state. But that's something that um, through the years we get more and more. Um, I think right now our membership is more outside the state than it is inside the state because so many people pass through Kentucky. Um, so, you know, that's a good point. It's, it, that's very interesting that you mentioned that because I can say from my research in West Virginia, my ancestors tended to stay. But you're right. Those that did venture from West Virginia, their first stop was just over the border into Kentucky. And I know that we talked a little bit about if they stayed, they stayed. But if they didn't, there was not just one path they migrated to. They, you were mentioning Texas, um, I think Oregon as yes. well. Mm -hmm. Probably the gold rush of California. Yes. So yes. there's not just that one you know, you think of the wagon train trail and just one path, not for Kentuckians. Right. And, you know, the the uh, the trail that they took uh, into Kentucky, they could have come down the Appalachian, uh, come over the mountains from from the uh, east side over. Or like my family came down the Ohio River because the Ohio River was like a, a highway. Um, and so people would come through Pennsylvania, get on the Ohio River, come down and they'd stay. Uh, Maysville had a big dock area where they came into um, and then they might move on down the Mississippi, even down into Louisiana. And so we have people that migrated that way as well. In, in like you said, the interesting thing about this is that you've got members from everywhere coming in that are interested. And we talk a lot about in a lot of our Appalachian groups, how the Scots Irish, for example, that's an easy one, right? And Scots Irish came into Kentucky. And a lot of times we can research our ancestors throughout Kentucky, but then we're asking people across the pond to pick up from there and help us with some brick walls. And I'm finding more and more that people over there are coming to us in saying, can you help us with the, the Virginia, the Kentucky, and the Carolinas to try and pick up? So I imagine that this, this is definitely a society that is absolutely globally minded. There's people probably all over researching this because Kentucky was a pretty important part of our life back then. You, you had to go through Kentucky back then to get to California, for example, or Texas. So, mm -hmm. so I think we forget that. I think that we just, now we've got planes and trains and automobiles and highways. And I think we forget that you had to get to Kentucky. 
Right. And, and our membership is not only in the states, the United, the, you know, we have, um, I think we're like in seven different countries now. We have members that, that uh, from different countries. And those are Kentuckians that have, their family has then migrated back out. Um, of That's awesome. And, and I imagine that creates this environment of researchers helping each other in the collaboration as well. Well, let's talk about that. That what do you do? What if I don't know what a, a genealogical society is? Let's say I just started. Somebody gave me a DNA kit or test for free and I did it and I'm lost, but I know all my people are in Kentucky or I need to research Kentucky. What it, what do you do? What is a genealogical society? So I think a lot of people make a mis they, they think, oh, it's only for professional genealogists. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely not true. It is for anyone who's interested in family research. And we are in Kentucky, but you don't have to be um, about Kentucky. Uh, you can just maybe live in Kentucky and want to research your family. Uh, so one of the things we endeavor to do is to connect other people. So we've got uh, chat rooms uh, set up on the website where you can meet other researchers. Uh, we also have uh, webinars at least twice a month to try to do things that are like Kentucky focused to help you learn to sharpen those research skills. But we also have a whole series that will just help you learn genealogy techniques in general. So we try to appeal to not only those looking at Kentucky, but those who just want to be better researchers. And we have a digitization grant program where we're working very hard to preserve records in Kentucky. It, hold that thought for one second, because we want to really dig into that, because this is really amazing that you guys are doing that. I want to point out, too, that I think there's also an extra little spot or bucket that you talk about. I noticed that you had how to preserve quilts, grandmother's quilts that some people might consider that part of ancestry and family trees, but that's just something that if you're in Appalachia, you're probably going to have grandmother's quilt. And you're, it was, I was just blown away by the, all the different webinars and learning that you have on the site. Okay. Where's your building? Where do I go? Do I go knock on a door? Our, our building is our website. That's what we tease everyone about. You know, come to our living room. That's what we call the chat room. Uh, come over to watch a webinar. That's where the auditorium is. Uh, everything in our house is at the website. I think this is the this is the future 10 years ago. You know what I mean? This was a way that people um, with societies can save some money instead of having that brick and mortar and really put the money towards the webinars and the digitalization. And that's what we're going to talk about next. This one, and we're going to spend some time here. I will tell it, um, everybody that if you are a member, and I don't care where you're sitting right now, anywhere in the world, if you are a member of your local, your city, your jurisdiction, your county, however you define local genealogical society, and they have $13,000 to fund to digitalize the documents and in partnership with family search let me know in the chat because this is this is rare this is not something that you hear of every day from a genealogical society in the united states there are some and some of those states are very large and have a lot of cash but for kentucky to do this and then also say hey we're going to partner with family search because family search is free you're not putting this behind a paywall. So I think that's something that we need to spend a little time on. And I will let you guys walk me through this. So when did this first start and how did you get the grant money? Well, 2020 was the first year that we did a grant and that, that we introduced the grant program. And uh, we started out with roughly $5,000 uh, that money came from uh, our members. They are very generous members. They're always giving us, maybe when they renew, they might give us an extra $10 or $20, uh, you know, which is great. And, and that's where we, our money came from for the first year. We gave uh, two grants. 
One was to the Filson Historical Society, and the other one was to the Todd County Library. Um, the uh, Filson Historical Society, what we helped them digitize were the, were the Baptist Orphan Home Records. And those uh, were from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. And Todd County, we helped them digitize uh, documents that were from a local historian that had passed who had like interviews and personal accounts and stories, just priceless information about families in Todd County. Then in 2021, we had two, two different um, recipients of the grant and program, and that was Carroll County Public Library and the Filson Historical Society were granted one again. And that was for the Bullet Family documents. And those are, those contain a lot of African American information, which is very rare. And so um, the Filson Historical Society worked really hard on those and, and we're very proud of, the, of that collection. Uh, we, and then in 2022, we had three recipients. They were the Ballard Carlisle Historical and Genealogical Society, the Cynthiana Harrison County Public Library, and the Greene County Public Library. Those also were a lot of local documents. Ballard Carlisle had city files. Um, the Cynthiana Harrison County uh, Public Library, we digitized for them the log cabin newspapers. And when um, I started looking at those newspapers, I, you know, that's that's Western Kentucky. And I didn't have any family from Western Kentucky, but I went in and searched some of my family and they had passed through there. And there was actually mention of them in those newspapers, which was so, ex so exciting. And I never even thought that, that I would have been there. Um, and I want to pause for a second because I want everybody to think about this. The, so, you know, you've been researching your family for 40 years and, and you have the, this probably large collection of research, family trees, documented out, source. And because of this digitalization funding and grants came in, you were able to do something like the log cabin newspaper. And on a whim, you probably typed in a family member name. And, right. and found it. And like you said, I mean, those finds, they just bring you joy. Uh, it, it, it just it just gives you that link to your past and you go, they came through here. They were mentioned. So I just want everybody to think about how much work that this society is doing for everybody. And do these three collections that we're looking at on screen, those are also on Family Search or there's just on your site? Uh, the log cabin is at the, the library site. Uh, the bullet papers are at the Filson. And the Carrollton, we've got Carrollton, and correct me, uh, Kathy, Todd County and Carlisle. Some of the collections are at the library and at our site for members only, but some of them are open to the public. It depends on how they worked with the grantee. Yes. And we want to mention, too, that we're going to talk about your new book in just a second. But again, this is also the book is funding the digitalization as well is continuing. Correct. That's the correct. proceeds from the book. Yeah. Yes. And then are you still working with grant money, too? Do you still get grant money to help? Because this is large. This is not a, an easy, quick project. <laughs> We, we were hoping to get $50,000 this year because it's our 50th anniversary. But so far, we've got about 7000 from the book, and that's just its first month out there. And then we've got, Kathy could probably tell you how much the members have already given us this year, but we'll have some more uh, giving through the year. And we've got another book coming out actually later in the year to help with this. So would you say that the the funding that comes in obviously pays for some things like to have the website up and things, but most of the funding goes towards your digitalization project. All it's two separate things. So mm -hmm. we, your membership fee is what pays for uh, the website. And then we keep money aside to ensure the society will last for another 25 50, or 50 years. Yeah. 
Any money that's given to us directly for the digitization grant program or is used to purchase the book goes directly to that. It is not, no one else gets it. It goes right to that. That's awesome. Now, uh, can you tell us what you might be working on now that's not quite available because you're still working on it? Uh, there was a lot of lectures that happened in 1974 when the society first formed. And what's kind of good about genealogy is whatever was true in 1974 happens to be true today. <laughs> and when I was looking through all this information, I'm like, I had no idea how Family Search got started. And I had no idea about this resource or that resource or about Virginia and North Carolina. So we pulled all of those lectures together and we've been editing them and we're putting them in a book. And that's what's going to be the next thing, because it's just it's fascinating all this older information and i think like you said um it was started because there was a need it wasn't there so they're they're doing these lectures and you know as we because we sometimes think about in appalachia the old way is still the good way so you still get down to the research you still go down looking at the documents the source documents and collaborating yeah. with, and with as a group so and when you want to do that older research because like it family search and all that it makes it easier to find maybe someone in the late 1850s but when you want to look at information prior to 1850 it's you've tough. got to go to books <laughs> yeah it's it's tough it's funny because uh sometimes we'll get somebody researching for the very very early 1800s and said you know, I can't find my ancestor. And, you know, as a professional genealogist, my I would always like kind of hold their hand and go, you're not alone. <laughs> you're not alone. We're all looking right. for that, that as well. Well, <laughs> since we're talking a little bit about how you do help, let, let's mention that now too. So when you say you educate the budding family researchers, I think it's important to go back to something you said towards the beginning where you're, site in your society is not just for those that would be considered professional genealogists. It's for anybody that has an interest in Kentucky history genealogy, right? That's exactly right. Um, we get, um, we, we focus a lot more on the genealogy, but we do cross over into history because you have to understand what was going on. What's the social context for your ancestors? And I think mm -hmm. a lot of that talk goes on in the front porch talks, Kathy. Yes. And what are the front porch talks? I love that. We have uh, we currently have three groups. One is on the Scotch Irish. Uh, one's on the pre eighteen fifty ancestors, and then all things DNA. And it is they meet once a month virtually, and there's usually you know um, a dozen or so that meet, and they discuss. Um, new research techniques, problems they're having with their research. They just discuss their family all together because, you know, when you're in genealogy, your, your family sometimes gets tired of hearing about, you know, the, the, the fourth great grandfather yeah. and what he did. <laughs> but, but here you're with like people that are searching possibly in the same area you're in. Uh, they've even, some of them have been able to connect their trees yeah. together uh, by talking. I would say in having the DNA, I think that's fabulous because that's where we're at now. The DNA tests, you can always find them on sale. It seems like every month more and more people are doing them. You've got a larger uh, group of individuals that is starting to become more global. It used to be more, you know, America centric, but it's starting to become more global, which is allowing us to go, as you mentioned, the Scotch Irish to try and figure out where those ancestors are. It, it, and then if you can get the Scotch Irish that are there now to come in and help you and you match your DNA, I can see where you're right, that the trees would just start connecting. Yes. And, and doing it. So I love the name Front Porch Talks. I think that's great. And when did you start this? Uh, it's been almost a year. It was May of last year we started the groups. And has it taken off? It has. And it's interesting that, you know, everybody's got to be friends. And, you know, we especially during the pandemic, we we weren't able to talk to each other or, or hang out with our friends. Yeah. But online, you can hang out with them and, and they, they've become friends. And, 
you know, like Trisha and I have become very good friends and we like to bounce off our research questions to each other. So uh, I would have never met her if it had not been for online and, and things like the front porch talks. And I think if anything positive came out of COVID, it was that what we realized we can do more and more online and meet online. It doesn't have to be um, a forced situation where people travel, pay for hotels, pay for gas, pay for um, fees to get into a symposium or something like that, that you can do it online. And I think your website is just set up so beautifully that it, it just welcomes you in as an online venture. Let's talk a little bit more about that collaboration as well. So how did, how did you first decide we're going to collaborate with Family Search? And what is that collaboration? Uh, they came to us. Uh, we, uh, what happened was there was a member who asked about a collection and we're like, oh, you know, we don't know, we don't have it. And so then she went out to Family Search and said, why aren't you talking to the Kentucky Genealogical Society and you need to be both? I guess she kind of gave them what for. And uh, <laughs> boy, they were on the phone with us. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been an interesting surprise. <laughs> yeah, we're like, uh, okay. And so they said, uh, you know, they wanted to get going on uh, working with the Kentucky archives and working with the county clerks. And we've got a wonderful volunteer, Susan Court. She's from Northern Kentucky, but she lives in DC. And she has been uh, just working tirelessly with the group, calling all the county clerks, trying to figure out where records are, who has what records, and how do we go about getting them digitized. That's a monster job, just trying to get to a clerk and have a clerk have time to talk to you and have an interest. So that that's a, a wonderful volunteer. It was, and it would actually help if everyone listening to this call called the Kentucky Archives and said, please uh, let Family Search come in and digitize those records. And um, let me pause for just a second if I can ask my producer to um, pull up the Kentucky Archives <laughs> website. <laughs> we will drop that link so everybody has the email and the phone number for that because it's so important. I, it, well, you can only get so far sometimes without it digitized. And I will I will point out if 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 you um, give me a moment to kind of go to Italy for a second. I was talking to some Italy researchers and they said you you'll find your own family search sometimes, but it's not going to be indexed. So there's that problem. But if it's not even digitized. That's a huge problem. We can't even yes, get yeah. to the search. So, so let's go ahead. The Kentucky Archive Society. And yeah. is it a funding thing, do you think, for them or an employee thing? Um, I, won't I, think they, I think they need to understand that uh, people find that it's important to them and they need to respond to the public. And I'll just leave it at that. And, that. and I will <laughs> also point out, I'm positive Kentucky is not the only state. I can list a three right now off the top of my head. Uh, one is in Appalachia, one is another two are not that will not, you know, part with the archives. So I think that as we become more of an online society, as we mentioned, hopefully those records will shake free. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, family search comes for free, but you know, they, we just have to encourage them for what's needed and what they want. But I'll just give a shout out to the KDLA because they've got excellent archivists over there. Rusty Heckleman helps me all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're out of state, it's only 15 bucks for to get research records, but they'll work tirelessly just like the public libraries do in Kentucky. I don't know how many times I've called Breathed County and Steve has looked things up for me, has sent things to me. I, I can't say enough good things. And I think, Kathy, there's some shout outs you would give the Kentucky libraries. Oh, definitely. The Boyd County Library uh, with Jim, he does a, a great job there. Their library is wonderful and he's very helpful, he, even on the phone. Uh, Greenup County has another one and uh, um, Fayette County. I, I, Trisha and I were talking about this today. There's not one county that I haven't reached out to at some time in my research that hasn't been willing to help out That's awesome. and do or, or, you know, help me out. And, and even 
Kathy mentioned something to, I believe it was the guy in Boyd County about something I was curious about. And he researched it for me and I didn't even ask him. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, well, since you're here you're talking to me on the phone, let's go ahead and, and see if we can find it. So I think that's, um, and, and that's also part of um, Appalachia. I'm not sure why that's showing. There we go. Um, so, oh, Boyd County Library. Okay. But um if we could look at, if my producer can pick up um, the Kentucky archives. Yeah, KDLA is KDLA. KDLA. We can, we can try and see that. Uh, I want to also mention that when you're talking about that collaboration as well, let's, I think that it's important to also talk about Kentucky in general is, you know, we talked about how people migrated there as well but let's talk about the the summer real quick the summer seminars that are upcoming you have two one is not announced yet right the first one the kentucky daughter of the east mother of the west is what happened was we surveyed our membership and we said tell us something that you're really interested in knowing about and overwhelmingly they came back with uh, like you've told us about migration into kentucky we want migration out of kentucky yeah. So our president, Chris, he, he's just awesome with all of this. He said, well, let's talk about Kentucky as the daughter of the East and the mother of the West. And he's going to be contacting uh, archives from, uh, I know, Texas, um, I think Missouri, and maybe um, Kathy knows some others. But he had a whole list of them that he's putting together for this uh, August uh, series that we're going to do. And I, I noticed we just had the link. If my producer can put the link, um, not in a banner, but if you could put it in the chat, that would be great. Um, when So if we're watching this webcast now, you just gave us a sneak peek that's not on your website yet. Do you, you know when that might come up? Uh, it's always in August. That's when we have it. But come June, God help you if you don't know we're having a, a seminar in August because we get really, really loud. We had like 300 people at our series last year. so That's fabulous. <laughs> and then on the website right now is uh, follow the GPS. And we're not talking about the GPS on your phone or your car. Uh, follow the GPS. It will not steer you wrong. And as a professional genealogist, I so agree with that statement. So you want to uh, tell us just a little snippet about what is follow the GPS? Uh, I know that it's a lady from Kentucky. I didn't schedule this one. <laughs> and I think, um, and I think the main thing to talk about with this is that, it, like I said, we're not talking about the GPS in your car, even though it kind of does make a little sense that is GPS, it but we're does. talking about the genealogical standard of proofs. So, um, yeah, Faye is a, she had a, a, just talking about the origins of Robert Jones and, you know, Robert Jones, probably everyone and their brothers named Robert Jones in Kentucky, <laughs> but uh, she went uh, from Hopkins County and she's going to talk about uh, how she went about figuring out the right Robert Jones and how she used that. And then we do have a free one coming up. Well, one that Kathy's going to do. I'm going to let Kathy tell you about it. And then one that uh, is free coming up also with uh, Melissa Barker, uh, which talks about the preservation of uh, handmade quilts. But Kathy's doing the Chinese migrants. Tell them about it, Kathy. And is that the that's the one that's for free if you're not a member? The uh, Preserving Your Kentucky uh, Ancestry. Well, that one's free. Okay. And Kathy, you, you, you really, you've got to give us some, a little bit more detail on the Chinese migrants. I'm fascinated by this topic. So give us some information. I kind of tripped over this while I was doing another research pro project that I ran into this gentleman who was Chinese that had come to Kentucky. And basically what he did was he, he started the um, laundry service in Eastern Kentucky. He would bring other um, Chinese men over they would be as young as 16 and train them in, in the work. And then they dispersed out of Ashland and into other cities in Kentucky, as well as other states surrounding. So that's basically what this, you know, is that my talk will be about that research, how he came here, what he did, and the contributions he made to Kentucky as a state, as well as the United States itself. What time frame was this? Was this gentleman... 
he arrived in 1877. So wow. it's just, it's, um, uh, the Chinese came to uh, the United States beginning in the early 1850s due to the gold rush, but that fizzled out pretty quickly. And then they were left here with, how are they going to make a living? It wasn't easy for them to get a job. And that's where the laundry service came in. It is fascinating because this is, you know, right after the Civil War. So we're, we're doing reconstruction as a, com as a country. You know, we're, we're heading west. We're building railroads. So I, I, I was totally fascinated when I saw this on your website last week. I was, I was like, this, to me, is worth being a member for the whole year, be, just to see this one, because it's a story you don't hear about. We don't yeah. hear sometimes about the, I'll say the other immigrants. We we all know the Scots Irish came, so this was a, a way to kind of expand. So I, I like to tell people that even though you might not have family that would be in your tree for this particular webinar, it's history and it's knowledge and it's just expanding your knowledge and history of Kentucky as well. So I think that's really awesome that you're doing that. And that one's coming up on May 11th. So not quite a month. So definitely add that to your calendar. If you are a member, if not become a member. And I think this is the best time to talk about the book. Yay. And we're going to talk about this book for a while. Now, I will tell you that I've had a sneak peek of this book. And I think some of the things that I'm blown away with is just the detail that you go into. But I love at the end, you give ideas of how to carry your research forward. There's so many essential guides to research they say, okay, go here, do this, make sure it is this source, make sure that it's the correct names or the locations and the people, and then goodbye. But you guys don't. You guys make sure that you see, now that you got this information, let's do something with it. And I love that. But let me, that was, that was my takeaway from the book that gave me so much joy. And I have zero family in Kentucky. I can tell you that uh, my husband has a lot a family. He, he's in the famous, you know, Hatfield McCoy groups over there. Um, but, you know. that, that, that was America's first reality TV because it was covered <laughs> so much in the media. <laughs> and, and you know, you're right. It is funny because uh, just recently, I couldn't believe it. Somebody uh, dropped it in one of my Appalachia chats and said, Oh, the Hatfields and McCoys is a real thing. That's a thing. And he <laughs> like, yes. And he goes, it's a thing. And you guys research and discuss it. And I was like, well, how do I put this gently? I said, of course, we're Appalachians. We're <laughs> <different> <laughs> family feud, including our own. <laughs> so, That's right. That's celebrated. Yes. <laughs> Let's research it, talk about it, you know, and then send it to Hollywood so they can change it. So <laughs> that's pretty much it. <laughs> but anyway, so I want to point out, because this was a question on my Twitter as well, when I first mentioned this book, somebody said, well, I don't know, maybe I know everything that I need to know about research. And I had to respond back. This book gives you some ideas that you had not thought of before. Okay, so let me let me come down off of you know the soapbox talking about how much I love the book, and let me have you guys go through the book. This is available on Amazon. It's a beautiful cover too, I might add, but it really is a comprehensive list. And let's go through the sections. Who wants to take this? So what we did was we have um, a, a newsletter or magazine called Bluegrass Roots that's been that was published for about fifty years. So I went through all of those old issues and I pulled out the articles that I thought were the most uh, representative and had the best advice. And then I combined that with some other information that a lot of other uh, actual Kentucky family researchers gave to me. So what we start out with is how Kentucky was formed in 1792, how it was part of a Fincastle County, Virginia is where it kind of started. And then that got, then Virginia decided they got, they got angry at someone and Kathy may know more of this than I do, but someone said they were going to be a British loyalist and they didn't like that. So like, no, we're going to divide it up and give it some different names and it'll be Kentucky County now. <laughs> and uh, then that got divided. And so we talk about how the counties formed because 
Kentucky loves to form counties. Only Georgia and Texas beat us out in counties. Yeah, I'm, I'm here in Georgia. I know they're counties. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to keep trying, though. Please, <laughs> I'll give you some. <laughs> Then we, then we do talk, you know, if you are new to it, we'll talk about the basics of family research so that uh, if you don't know how to research, we'll show you how. And Cynthia Mahari, uh, she's a great genealogist. She talks specifically about pedigree charts and, and using funeral programs to get more information. And her whole talk is available out on our learning library. And then we talk about where to find resources in Kentucky. So a lot of people don't know that the tax list, this is what was done between the census records and the tax lists are where you can find people's names listed year after year, as opposed to waiting 10 years for something to happen. There's uh, newspapers, uh, you know, we've got the, we've got the down low on where all the good stuff is. And then there's a lot of different ways that you just do uh, genealogy research. And one of my favorites was uh, we had a lady, very old uh, researcher that she talked about how you use maps and it was just so precious. She's like 96 years old, Beverly Hathaway. And she uh, donated an article to us and she talks all about um, different things you can do with maps. And then I went in and added information from the Moorhead Digital Archive where they have stuff from Robert Rennick and just great information. And then how do you share your research? And I've mentioned Susan before, but Susan talks about, uh, you know, hey, are you, do you want to do a book? Uh, do you want to just put something together from Kinko's? You know, here's how you write it. And she's written four different uh, family uh, books. And the most important tip I got from her, because this is what you want to do when you start out. You're like, I'm going to write this book about all my grandparents and their family and their family. And this is going to be like the Encyclopedia Britannica of me. And she's like, no, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> she, said she gives you some alternate ideas. And another older researcher, uh, Betty Darnell, she said, sometimes you have to trick your family into being interested in your research. And so what she did was start sending emails out every week with a picture and then telling some family about that. And then her family started getting interested. And I'm like, that was so sneaky, Betty. I, I envy you. It was, it was brilliant because, you know, everybody will look at text and go, OK, and, and move on. But the picture stops you. And who is yeah. that? What were they wearing? Who were they with? Oh, How am I related exactly. to this It's funny because when you were saying that, both Kathy and I were like going like <laughs> there, trying to get family interested to spill the beans and spill the dirt. And I will that, say that, you know, we, we probably might not mention it, but if you're in Appalachia, you already know of something called an MPE. And there's oh. a lot of ways to find <laughs> Those, those, and I will just leave that at that because this book also has different ways to kind of, like you said, defining the sources and not waiting. And sometimes it's 20 years because, as we know, 1890 is a mystery to us. It certainly is. But thank goodness my great great grandfather, uh, he was married to the same woman all of his life. She's not my grandma, but um, thank goodness, you know, hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So I, you know, I think that is amazing what's in the book, but it's very reasonably priced as well. And I will um, have my producer drop the book. I think he already did. Uh, let me let me do it for him uh, real quick. And the book is available one place, one place only, Amazon. And they use these proceeds to go back to that digitalization projects that they have. So when you buy the book, you're, you're kind of interesting because you are funding your future research. Mm. So keep that in mind, too. It's a really it, it is a wonderful book. I will tell you that one of the, the tips I won't go into details, but one of the tips at the end that that I've done in the past and I was so thrilled that you mentioned it is how to how to make your own ebook. It is it is very easy. Mm -hmm. It's not difficult. It's not challenging. But that is detailed. That, that's how much detail you also put in there to make sure that when you collect this information, it doesn't just stay on a shelf back here. 
-hmm. where nobody can research it or read it. And I want everybody to think about it. After you buy this book, you do your research, you look at how to share the research and how to get it out there. Think about, you know, two to three, four generations from you now are going to be so grateful that you did that. And you're also giving back to the Kentucky Genealogical Society with the proceeds going towards the digitalization program. So I think it, I think it was just a brilliant idea, but the book is awesome. Thank you. So I, I think that, and you guys have done some record sales, I think, with it as well. We have. We've uh, raised almost $7,000. Uh, so, I, and again, all volunteer, all of the money from this goes directly to the grant program. There's no siphoning off of any. The only thing we had to pay for was just uh, to get an ISBN number and then a few proofs. And we sent some things out to the authors that helped us. But uh, other than that, it's, you know, it's all going toward that fund. And I just want to leave because I know that we do have a global audience. So I just want to leave them with just a little bit of information. But if you have a question, now's the time to put it in the chat. We're taking questions in about a minute or two. And I think it's important to understand that Kentucky became a state and it kind of carved out of Virginia. But you can see all the counties. And I recognize something like that being in Georgia. So it's very interesting. Kentucky becomes a state with just three counties. And then they say, that's just not enough. So let's, go, let's keep going and going, going. How many counties do you have in Kentucky now? 120. 120. And don't ask me, Georgia. I don't, I gave up counting. I gave <laughs> Some of the counties are so small that I'm like, really, just merge, please, just merge. Please. We had 120 at one time, and the, the that 121th, I, I think it just uh, lasted maybe a month or not even that. Three months. Three, three months. months. <laughs> three Beckham months. Beckham County, and, and then they got they got irritated and said, "No, you can't, uh, <laughs> you can't have it," and they made them get rid of it. <laughs> I, I talk about, oh, there we go. So with Georgia's under, I think, what was it? Texas has, is the winner of the yeah. states. But since we were talking about a global audience, I will bring up one of our um, Appalachian pals who does research a lot for us in England, Wales, and Ireland. Um, we call him Irish John, Mr. John Tyner. <laughs> and so 1792. So it's kind of interesting for those across the pond to see when our states became states. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, <laughs> we don't want to compete with Texas. No. But they're a lot. They're a lot bigger geographically than that's uh, true. You know, so and we definitely. Um, yeah. Don't want to compete, but um, we can give them some more if they'd like to. <laughs> And real quick before we take questions, uh, can you tell me a little bit, because I think, Tricia, you do this part, the Bluegrass Roots. Yeah, so this is a blog, uh, and it's written by some of our members. Uh, I will, ex if you have an idea about, you know, you want to talk about your family or you want to talk about some idea you have, I would be happy to hear it. We, we have only turned away the guy that wanted to talk about casinos. Uh, so... We've got like five or six different topics. And if you go up to the bluegrass roots there at the top, you can see some of the ways that we've got it broken out. You know, we talk about finding free resources, uh, genealogy tricks that we know. Uh, over on the sides, we've also got, uh, you know, yeah, categories. You can get more information about specific things. I've been building out religion and I've been building out occupations is what I've been working on. So there's a lot of upcoming content on religion and more content on military. And I, I know that I put you on the spot uh, just about, you know, a day ago, the Huguenots. Uh, that was a surprise to me. We know the Scots Irish, the Chinese were surprised, but the H Huguenots came over in to Kentucky as well. So there's a lot to research here and the finding free resources, the best genealogy tricks. Now, can, can I get to this? If I am not a member or this is member only? Our blog is completely free. Okay. Uh, that's completely free. Our learning library, uh, it's $20 a year and you have access to our everything that's in our learning library and you have access to any upcoming, um, any upcoming event. 
The seminar does cost 20 bucks because we have some speakers come in. So we just ask for 20 bucks for that, but very minimal considering there's usually six or seven uh, series of that. It, it's just all done online. Everything is, is to join is online. And I will tell I, $20 is such a bargain for what you get. I am part of many small, small local up to the state and even larger genealogical societies. And I had not one of them is $20. <laughs> it's well over. So you guys have done a fantastic job to keep it at a reasonable price range for everybody. Okay. Let's talk a little bit. Let me remove this. Let's talk a little bit. Now we had a couple things. I've got a couple things to go on. So um, are all digital documents you mentioned you funded available to members via the internet without going to the place where they are housed? So I assume if they're in a library, a physical library, are they also available on the internet? Uh, yeah, so it's a, uh, the idea is that it's a digitization grant because uh, I thought Kentucky's kind of a poor state. Uh, and they get a lot of disasters like last year they had mm -hmm. the flood they had the flood in Breathitt County and, and around the other areas and I know they lost some records and then they had the hurricane or not the hurricane the tornado the year before that so it puts all these records in uh, a lot of peril so we want to get them digitized get them up in the cloud uh, have them so they're available do you, um, that's a good question. Did we lose a lot? Like in Hinman, we just uh, had the Appalachian Artisan Center a week ago on our webcast. And she was showing the pictures of the devastation of what they lost. The artists lost their, their rooms that they create, their the materials they create. The, it, it, I mean, the strings gone. Everything is, they had to rebuild pretty much on the inside. So I never thought about it when talking to her. I guess there's a large chance we lost some records if they weren't digitized as well. Yeah, I'm sure there are. I'm sure we won't know for a few years, you know, what some of the things, disasters yeah. that did happen. And then this is a good point that Vonda brings up. Eastern Kentucky is often referred to as a cradle of the patriots. Many Revolutionary War patriots settled and raised their families there. So, yes, many passed through Kentucky to the rest of America. It, it, a, it a lot stayed, but I think this is a, a really interesting point to make. Again, they had to go through Kentucky, and those are some mountains over in eastern Kentucky as well. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and let's see. That's Deborah says, I live in Richmond, a husband's family in, in West Virginia, and she's researching Kentucky. So this is a good case of Virginia, West Virginia and Kentucky. And I will tell you, most of my research for my ancestors is in West Virginia. And I find that West Virginia, Virginia and Kentucky are like this perfect little trio of, mm -hmm. of, of research. It seems like if you're searching one, you're searching the other two and vice versa. Okay. And then... Mike Holmes' ancestors came into eastern Kentucky, specifically Perry County from Virginia. So there's a good case. Stephen, did they stay or did they migrate out? That would be interesting to find out as well. Seems like a lot of those mountain folks stay. My family stayed there. <laughs> I think I'm the first one that left the state. Oh, and, you know, it's funny because my West Virginians, they mostly stayed until the, I guess, the 60s, 70s, when you get the migration, the Rust Belt migration that you hear about. Um, here's Bonda again. And these are some surnames. And I love seeing these surnames. So if you're watching this particular webcast today live or in the future, I'm looking at this list of surnames and I'm very familiar with almost all of them, but I will point <laughs> out two. Pettit, which is going to be a lot around Hinman because we have the Hinman Settlement School with um, Miss Pettit and her, I always get it wrong, is it Biscuit Brigade or Crusade? I think it's Brigade that um, she started, but also Fugate. Do you guys want to explain why the Fugates are familiar okay. to Appalachians? Well, those are my cousins, but they have the blue people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think Ripley's, believe it or not, likes to talk about the blue people. The blue people of <laughs> Kentucky. And then here's Deborah again. She's looking for Haley and Rimpo and Rock Castle 
County. So where would she go? Um, Rockcastle County has uh, quite a, an archive. They've got a lot of records online. Uh, there's a Facebook group where they talk about this specifically. My family's from Rockcastle County also. Uh, Good question, the, uh, Deborah. We can, <laughs> we're prepared. Yeah. Family Search. Uh, family Search has quite a bit of information. Uh, so she'll newspaper. probably newspaper. She'll find a lot online. This isn't one where she probably won't have to go. It make a phone call and research. Rock Castle has quite a bit online. I think so. And actually, if you go to Facebook, there's a, if you go to that Facebook group for Rock Castle County, there is an excellent local researcher where if you pique her interest, she will uh, she'll run off and find stuff for you. And even oh, no. Kentucky Gen Web, <laughs> Kentucky Gen Web's got a really nice yeah. built out Rock Castle county site and i think rootville valley there's a barn there uh, a big entertainment complex for the rootville valley that uh, that's where disputana that's where my one place study was uh sandy i love your one place study and i will say this is how i met trisha through her one place studies because i'm so jealous they are so beautiful looking and those are on <laughs> wiki tree so if you've got a uh, one place study that you want to talk about for a town i invite you to come over to wiki tree it like family search it is free it is a place where there's just one tree there's not everybody gets their own trees one tree everybody collaborates which is so fabulous because again this is how i met trisha is through her one place study and it's great to have the one place study because you can combine the person's life but also all the neighbors per se everybody in that settlement if it was pioneer time all the way up to now okay and then let's see so deborah i think we we got your question if if you need more information down in the description is the society's information how to contact them and remember that trisha has some family there but it sounds like if you go to facebook the rock castle county facebook page that would be your best bet and they would they will have a lot of information there and we brought up uh bonda's surnames and oh um well isn't he smart um the producer without even asking, went and found the tax list that you were talking about too. And that's a good way to mine data. So what will I find on these tax lists? Katie? I've not used these tax lists. So, uh, Oh, I haven't either. <laughs> I've, the family search has them. That's the ones I've used. They've They're probably got, the uh, same ones. They're the same ones. Oh. They're just probably over it. And I think what you'll find is you'll find names. You'll find what they have as well as equipment, what they own. Um, I have, I do know that I have researched very little in my husband's family because I keep hoping that he will pick up that research. <laughs> I've had enough of my own, but uh, he had moonshiners. So occasionally you'll see an abundance of corn <laughs> in the tax lists and things like that. I tell you something I will add though, is with the tax lists and these were Pennsylvania. So I would think the Kentuckys would have the same thing that um, you saw the animals and the number of animals they had. Mm -hmm. And this was my Scotch Irish family and they had all the sheep. So I can only assume, and we're talking about the late 1700s that they were maybe weavers or, or, you know, along that line because they had raised all this sheep uh, and it was the tax list that gave it. And you're it. right. Back in that day, there wasn't that much need for meat. Yeah. And so you're, you're right. And that's yeah. just some of the clues that you can mine as you go through the resources. And again, a lot of these resources are, in the book that we were talking yeah. about as well. Yeah, you'll find women on the tax list also because it was uh, 20 yeah. men who were 21 years or older. And if the man, the, fan, the head of the family died, the female would be on there, the mom, if the boys were younger. So uh, in that chapter of the book, I talk about researching women and it's one of the you know little tricks to finding women. And if you have any more questions, just let us know. Let me take one more peek through here. Um, okay, so thank you for posting um, the Gen Web Rock Castle. So that's a great help as well. And uh, yeah, quite a few. Um, Lee County, Virginia, Claiborne, Tennessee, and Bell County, Kentucky. You're right. That is a good little section there. Uh, we've got somebody related to the hogs. The hogs is of of Kentucky. 
And um, Bonda comes up and says that Stephen Combs family is the same as mine, just a different branch. And this is where we're, this brings us back to what we were saying before. <laughs> Kathy said a lot of the people are connecting their trees. This is a front porch type of idea here. So many are still there living on the same land settled by our shared grandfathers. It, it, does anybody in chat, you guys do family reunions now that COVID's done? Have they come back to Appalachia? I saw for someone on Facebook, someone was saying that they had, uh, they were going to, uh, maybe it was the Payne family actually. and They were inviting everyone to, Someone, you, you can tell I listened to it really well. Like <laughs> someone's doing something at some time. <laughs> but usually, if they mention food, we'll be more we'll be more in tune. <laughs> with That's it. right. If they said food at a reunion. Yeah. And I agree with Vonda. The the blue food because they you know this is another thing where somebody gets an idea and then they just keep keep with it. Uh, we have the link with the uh, information. And data, I guess, like a press release almost with the partnership with Family Search. And Vonda also mentions the land warrants and transfer deeds are very helpful. And I will tell you, Vonda, land warrants and deeds have been a major subject in the past 48 hours in my professional genealogy world. Uh, here we go. Susan would like to know are church records being digitalized? What do you can bring them to us? Go on. Yeah, we, we haven't at this point, but um, the application process is usually from August 1st to November 1st. And as we get closer to that, that date, um, Trisha will post on the web page, you know, the application and everything. And you can apply um, because there is a committee that reviews those and they score them. And, and uh, uh, if there's valuable information that needs to be digitized, please. You know, let us know. What happens if if I don't know? Do I and I want to find these church records? Do I call the church? Do I reach out to the church? Well, I just, or do I go to a higher level? Like for example, do I go to you know the pipe um, you know or Lexington Methodist Church, or do I go to Korea, the Kentucky okay. Methodist Church up up one? And it, I guess Susan, are we way back in the day? Yeah, up to it now? depends. So like yeah. Maria College, Maria College and their digital archive has a lot of the Eastern Kentucky old regular Baptist records. Yeah. Um, then uh, a lot of the denominations, so the Southern Baptists will do a lot of theirs. The Methodists will do a lot of theirs. So probably the church records that she's thinking of are the more local ones where they're not associated with them, with some uh, mm -hmm. association. Is that what you think, Kathy? Yeah, I would think so. You know, uh, I know with the Methodist Church, you may find records in the individual church, or you may find them like at Asbury College um, in their library. And there are other Methodist uh, colleges that that they, I think, some of the churches send their their documents to. So let me ask you this: If I don't, if, well, let me backtrack. Let me ask you: If I do know the denomination, then how would I go about finding who might have the documents that aren't online yet? You it's so out. funny that, yeah, that you, I, I just posted, a, I was working on a blog post today about this topic and the guy was talking about the problem with some of this is the records get scattered because mm -hmm. you don't know if the minister was keeping them or the secretary was keeping them. So you have to do a lot of detective work. So yes, start at the denomination head. So I would start maybe with the Southern Baptist because Baptist is prevalent in uh, Kentucky. Start there and see what they have, but also use Google Maps or something like that to look around the area where your family live to see what churches are there. And you may have to, uh, it may, the, this is what's part of the fun, Sandy. You have mm -hmm. to go track it down. You do. <laughs> it's not just click on a website and pull it up, which I think this is fabulous because I bet if Susan's calls some of the local churches, like you said, she brings it up, she's going to have such wonderful conversations with whoever yeah. answers the phone, whether they have the documents or not. <laughs> you know, you're still going to have the wonderful conversations. And then they'll, they might send you to the next place and the next place might send you on. 
but it's a journey throughout. So uh, let's see. Uh, we've got a reunion coming up, a colossal undertaking. Fonda, tell us what number equals colossal. But I would love this. I love seeing people out and about after COVID. It's time that we get out. It's time that we travel. And I think I also saw that you're in partnership with uh, working with Germans that came to Kentucky. And there, in June, there's going to be at one of the libraries, I believe. So there, it, there's ample ways to make a trip to Kentucky to visit a genealogy research, you know, take a tour down the Bourbon Trail and it, look and see the churches or where your ancestors were as well. Let me see. Born and raised on the West Coast and living in Kentucky now. So trying to find how the family went went from Kentucky to Missouri to California. And I'm going to agree with Trisha on this one. Your last <laughs> comment you made, this is part of the fun. Yeah. that You know, I found a lot of fun. When I was doing Rock Castle County research, a lot of my family went from uh, Rock Castle County over to Missouri. And I, it must have had something to do with the Civil War. I think a lot of people, well, they got offered land, but I know a lot of people were a little worn out with the whole slavery discussion and I don't know if they were running from or running to something, but definitely it was a lot easier to travel out of the middle of Kentucky over to Missouri than it was, uh, you know, coming out of those mountains. Yeah. And those mountains. So it, I think that's it for the questions that we have here. So I just have uh, two really, really quick questions. And the first one would be, what are we getting wrong about Kentucky? What, what are people that when Kentucky comes to their mind and if there's something, you know, I don't want to say negative, but what are misunderstood. So what are we getting wrong about Kentucky? When we first got this, uh, a designer did this website for us and his very first try showed um, this black and white picture of this coal miner who, who looked like he was getting ready to go on strike or he looked down on his luck. And I, I was so insulted by that picture. And I, I just, I'm like, take this website back and you bring me something that's representative of Kentucky. We are not this downtrod people who've been beaten down. We're resilient people. You know, it comes from, we come from all walks of the globe and we are, you know, we can beat back against things. I was just, I think that's, to me, that was the big misconception and like a time when I really got offended by someone thinking Kentucky's more than coal mines, you know? Mm -hmm. What about you, Kathy? Well, Kentucky's one of the most beautiful states. It really um, is. You know, being from West Virginia, almost heaven, West Virginia. Um, I've heard people say, well, then when you arrive, Kentucky, you are in heaven. You know, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the bluegrass of Kentucky. I mean, the horse farms that you have, the Kentucky Derby, it, 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 that whole part as well mm -hmm. is just downright beautiful. I, you could drive and see the white fences and, and the grass and the horses. I mean, there's so many different parts to Kentucky. And I think it's because the way it's laid out, if it was more, you know, vertical, you might not see as much difference, but the way that it's laid out and elongated, you see different parts of Kentucky in the big cities as well. Cause Kathy, you live in one of the big cities. I do. And, and you mentioned the white fences, but I'm more partial to the, the rock walls oh, fences yeah. that are, are made by the, uh, the Scotch Irish and are even when we have some that get damaged, they have a whole crew that just has trained with the, with uh, um, the Irish people to be able to put them back up the way they were. Um, and, and if you go to Western Kentucky, like land between the lakes, that's a gorgeous area mm. there. Um, mm -hmm. And it's so different than the Eastern side. So you can stay in our state and you can, well, they say too, when it comes to weather, if you don't like the weather in Kentucky, wait a few moments, it'll change. It'll change. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but then also, you know, Kentucky's really good. We love ancestry. We love talking mm -hmm. about it. We, I'm sorry, yes, we cling to our patriots, uh, you know, the, the men who fought so hard to help this country come to life. Uh, you know, that's, that's, those are my grandfathers. And 
people love to talk about it and they want to help you. So if you want help researching in Kentucky, come talk to us. We love to talk to you. We love to dig into it. We want to talk about it as long as you want to talk about it. And just think about it that for $20 a year, not only are you going to get those webinars, we have a hundred now, Trish is getting ready to load up 10 more, but the front porch to me is invaluable because if you're not in Kentucky and this is still going to be a virtual environment, even because if they don't have a building, you're going to knock on the door. But if you're not in Kentucky or anywhere globally, you have friends and you have people collaborating or know where to go, where to answer the questions. So Deborah, that might be another suggestion too. If you're not a member yet, definitely think about becoming a member for $20 a year. Not only do you get the webinars and you get the information from the blogs, but you get this collaboration on the front porch. That is, is brilliant idea that you guys came up with. And I think since you have the three groups, it's really taken off. It's been a year, you said. So I think that's really great. Let me finish this then with um, a comment about the book again. And I know that you probably think that I'm pushing this book just to push it, but I'm not. I'm not that person. I don't do that. If I um, do not like the book, then um, I do not book the guest. <laughs> I guess that's what I say. <laughs> say it the easiest way. And, you know, I had gotten a sneak peek before Tricia had yeah, given me the full peek. And I have to say that if you are starting out or if you are a mid-level experience or even advanced progen, as an advanced progen, I learned even things that I didn't think about. And I learned how to look at things a little bit different in my own tree. I do not know a lot about Kentucky. And like I said, I think I'm going to pick up my husband's line here. This book was fabulous because I'm clueless. I was clueless for Kentucky. So I think that if you guys can have the opportunity to buy the book, definitely, definitely buy the book. It is up on Amazon. That is the only place that you can find the book. You, it's not uh, something where you have to go to a location to find it or a specialty bookstore or buy online from the Kentucky Society, Genealogical Society. It's right there convenient on Amazon every bit of the profits go back into that digitalization program. And I guarantee you, you'll be thankful for that because every day, I say this to people every day, no matter what program you're using, whether you're using the paid service or family search or a uh, local or state genealogy, things are getting indexed every day. New things come up every day. So if you can't find it today, you might find it tomorrow and next week. But in Kentucky, you might find it because specifically you help them digitalize with the funds of this book going there. So I highly recommend it. And I do want to leave with a quote that Trisha gave as we go through. So I want to again, thank you ladies for joining us today. If anybody has any questions or all our comments, definitely go to the website. It's down in the description. I highly recommend that you get a yearly membership. Try it out. It's it's something that's educational and also helpful. I want to congratulate you guys also on your 50th anniversary because that is a really major deal. And to see the photographs of when they started in their smiling faces just brings <laughs> joy to see that then and see it now on your face. And I'm going to leave this with a quote from Trisha to say thank you to all of those who make Kentucky their home before we did. And that kind of gives me a little bit of warm fuzzies and chills because there's a lot there that did that. So I want to thank everybody for joining us and thank you ladies. This has been really great and educational. I've learned a lot as well. I, I, I was going to go ahead and end it. I see Susan popped up one question. So real quick, she has Dawson's in Hart County in that magical time frame. Where would she go to search? Ah, uh, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> what I would do is I would go to first thing I would do is go to family search and I would page turn some some like the order books and things like that. Um, people forget that if it's not in the index, well, yeah. you know, they search for it and it's not there. They quit. Don't, you know, look oh, yeah. at the books, go through them. Yeah, I would agree. And it, also, if you need another eye and you don't have somebody in your family that wants to talk about genealogy anymore, 
this is another reason to join. You've got that front <laughs> porch. You've got flavors. You've got people here. I can tell you that I will go and survey a cemetery. For example, when my mother thinks I'm the weirdest child ever. <laughs> so you, you don't know, drag like, her. You don't yes. drag your mama with you. No, <laughs> she refused. <laughs> Too, too, too heavy. <laughs> I do drag my husband now. So, <laughs> so keep in mind that that's another reason you've got this friendly group of Kentuckians. Uh, what could be better? You know? So I want to again, thank you, ladies. And thank you for letting me sneak that last bit in. Deborah, thank you for buying the book. You're going to love yes, it. And Deborah, I want you to come back you. and tell us. Come back after you get it and read it and leave a comment on this YouTube and tell us how much you loved it and what you love best about it. <laughs> Other than that, everybody have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. So much.